In the last days of the corrupted Judean nation, just before their captivity, the prophet Habakkuk cried out in confusion to the Lord. You know, how can evil and, more, and immorality just continue to go unpunished? Uh, he thought, you know, how can this ungodly nation of the Chaldeans oppress Judah, the, the very people of God? Well, in chapter 1 of the book of Habakkuk, the Lord answered, and he assured him that God was still in control, even over the Chaldeans. They were being used by God to chastise his rebellious nation. But uh, his use of this evil nation in no way approved its evil. They were still evil. Uh, the advice the Lord gives Habakkuk beginning in chapter 2 is very helpful to us. It says the soul of the arrogant and proud is not right within him. But uh, the righteous, in contrast, will live by their faithfulness. They live with a firm and uncompromising confidence in the divine promises, the things God had made known and revealed. Uh, for the moment, uh, the reasons behind particular sufferings might be hidden. Uh, but we were created to trust in the sufficiency of God's word, what he had said, not trusting in the circumstances the way they might appear to us. Well, after a poem of judgment given as a warning to the oppressors in chapter 2, verses 6 to 10, Habakkuk offered a prayer in response in chapter 3. And from the style, we, we see that it's in the form of the lyrics to a song. Uh, it followed the style of Hebrew poetry that's known as uh, Shigenot. It's a song sung emotionally, enthusiastically with accompaniment. And the song ends in verse 19 with a typical musical subscription like those we often see at the end of Psalms. There it tells us that it was written for the choir director, which means it was probably intended for the use in public worship, and it was written to be accompanied by a stringed instrument. Well, as the song unfolds, we see that it addresses three different groups of people. One is the superficial people of Judah. Uh, they had offended their God with their evil ways and compromises. Uh, these were those who claimed to be God's people, but they weren't inwardly trusting in him. Another group was the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Chaldeans. Uh, this was an evil nation, and they had boldly and arrogantly oppressed God's people just for their own gain, to satisfy their own arrogance and pride. But the third group, were those faithful people in Judah. Uh, they remained humble and they confessed their own weaknesses and sin. They were resting in the Lord and in him only for their provisions for salvation and blessing. Uh, though they needed God's chastisement to make them grow in faith, they would soon see the Lord coming in judgment as vindication of his sovereign power. So in this final section of the book of Habakkuk, verses 16 and 19 of uh, chapter 3, Habakkuk records his, his own response to the Lord's message. Here's what he says, beginning at verse 16. He says, When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes to his people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. Well, there's three main actions described in verse 16. Uh, it, sometimes it's helpful to look for the verbs or phrases that describe what's going on. First, there's the Hebrew uh, word there that's translated that Hebrew that Habakkuk heard. He heard this voice of the Lord. He heard the report of the Lord, uh, the report of his coming soon as judge and as savior. It was more than just hearing words, though. Uh, the concept here is a hearing with understanding, uh, something you would meditate upon and appreciate what was being said. Second, there was something that made him tremble in what he heard. Uh, he trembled at the message of Jehovah. Uh, his whole person was involved in, in awesome fear as he felt it deep in his inner parts. Uh, the word used here means his stomach and intestines, as they're often uh, where we feel those effects of strong emotions. Uh, it tells us that his lips quivered, and he felt decay or rottenness in his bones, you know, a feeling at the very center of his bones that seemed frozen up with fear. And he says he trembled in himself. He was about to experience the awesome power of the Almighty God 
as he brings judgment that would fall all around him. And third, uh, he knew there was something that would give him rest, the rest he longed for. He knew he should wait quietly for that day of trouble, word meaning distress or tribulation. And that day when the wicked nation will rise up by the Lord, will be raised up by the Lord, and will be used as his instrument of chastisement and will invade. In God's good time, he promised his wrath and chastisement will be brought to pass. Even though we may wonder why it's being withheld, God has his reasons. And as uh, the contemporary prophet Jeremiah said to uh, King Zedekiah, Jeremiah 38.3, he said, Thus says the Lord, uh, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. The time of covenant cursing had come. And the fig will not blossom. There will be no fruit on the vines. The olive crop will fail. There will be no food. The flocks will be cut off. There will be no cattle in the stalls. All this was the result of Israel's own covenantal disobedience. But God's covenant involves our daily lives. There are blessings of covenant obedience. And Deuteronomy 28 describes both the blessings and the cursings that come when we either obey or disobey what God has commanded and promised. There in verses 1 to 14, Deuteronomy 28, it speaks of the blessings, that God promises blessing on your children, your crops, your cattle, your flock, your bread and your barns. It says he will give you victory over your enemies and they will fear and honor you. And you will abound in prosperity. If we live the way the Creator designed us to live, there will be a natural cooperation and harmony with the ways the universe was designed to work. We become part of the display of God's goodness and purity. Uh, there will be blessing for our obedience when it's done to honor the Lord, uh, giving Him all the glory for moving our hearts to even desire to do what's right. But there are also the cursings of the covenant. What happens when we disobey? And that's found in verses 15 to 68 of Deuteronomy 28. There, God warns of cursings on your cities, your bread, your children, your crops, your cattle, your flock, your health. You'll be defeated by your enemies. And they will oppress and mock you. You will lack what you need and want, and your efforts will yield very little. Well, if we live contrary to the way we're made to live, there are going to be conflicts with the natural created order of things. Things aren't going to work right. Our families won't work right. Our society won't function properly. And people will be used by God to bring judgment, to wake us up, or to bring judgment on those who won't wake up because they're still dead in their trespasses and sins. And they will remain that way. There's going to be consequences which earn the chastisement of our loving and concerned Heavenly Father. And we will stir the just anger of our Creator. Well, the Lord said this in Haggai chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. They were being judged because of their neglect of rebuilding the temple of God. It says there, You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We're to pray for covenant blessings, which implies praying for God to work in us so that we will live in ways that honor him. It's not our obedience that stirs God's grace. It's God's grace that stirs our obedience and even gives us a desire for it. Our responsibility is to humbly seek the Lord's strength in those difficult times and to determine to sincerely live in ways that honor him no matter what happens around us. Though times of uh, oppression, failure in business, loss of health, and threat to our national security might come along, how should we live? Well, we should remember the initial advice given in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verse 4. The just shall live by his faith. That is, he lives by trusting in what God has revealed about our daily thoughts and words and actions and about the very God who made us and redeemed us himself. We need to return to those things that please him morally and which give him the glory. <clears throat> Proverbs 14, 12. <coughs> a little bit of a warning. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 
And then in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, we're told this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Through all this the Lord remains our joy and our strength. Let's take a look at this next portion, verses 18 to 19. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like the deer's feet, and He will make me walk on my high hills. Uh, to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. So it is that the Lord gives us this wonderful promise. There's great joy in living faithfully for the Lord. The yet I in this verse is the turning point in this song of Habakkuk. While there's suffering and ominous threats of invasion, uh, while tempted to question things or to doubt, he's wise to trust in what God has already made known. Uh, to live faithfully to what he knows is true and sure. The result of living faithfully is joy and a secure standing by the power of the Creator. Joy is one of the covenant blessings that God promises to his people. But it's only possible when they live in harmony with the way our Creator made us to live. The joy of the believer far exceeds all the superficial and temporal joy of those living out of harmony with the Creator. The world substitutes very poor imitations for true joy. Chaldeans took what wasn't theirs to find joy. They engaged in idolatry and subjugated the innocent from other nations. But of course the Lord is going to bring judgment on them. And they would find no satisfaction no uh, security in those things. Drug users look for pleasure in chemically induced moments of calm, uh, which in the long term destroys them. False religion offers false promises. Sexual perversions indulge the body and mind with things that are, are totally in disregard of the law of God, the way he made things to be. None of these bring the inward lasting peace the Creator offers. There is a peace of God which surpasses all understanding, as Paul tells us in Philippians 4.7. I wrote a little poem in summary of this. Let me put that up for us for a second. Where can a person find joy in his heart? The kind of joy that will not depart? If it comes from our music, surroundings, or play, how can we find it when they go away? If it comes when things happen about which we boast, it will not be there when we need it the most. If we feel it from substances fooling our soul, one day their lives will have taken their toll. When it comes from the promises made by our King, it lingers in blessings about which we sing. Living by faithfully trusting the Lord brings us strength. God's true covenant people will endure and survive victoriously. God makes the feet of his children, it says here, to be like deer's feet. Uh, the imagery here is of those swift and sure-footed deer that run along the twisted, narrow, dangerous mountain paths. Uh, the analogy actually comes from David's psalm of praise in 2 Samuel 22, verse 34. There he said, He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on my high places. So how will we make it along the winding paths of life here in this lost and struggling world? Well, the Lord is our strength. He shows us the path. And by his strong hand and by his grace alone, he makes his children to learn to walk on it. Sometimes we have to be chastised a little bit, like a loving father has to chastise his erring children. But he brings us back and he teaches us and he will not let us go. Uh, we won't have to hide in the valleys in fear of the oppressors or invaders. Uh, we will manage those steep and twisting paths without fear of slipping and falling. God's people will endure and will rise up in victory. And that will come when God's judgment finally falls on those who dare to harm his own children, the children of our Redeemer. Psalm 18, verses 46 and 47, it says, The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. And then Psalm 27 begins with these words. The Lord is my strength and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?